Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Shan Overton, and I'm the director of the Center for Writing and Learning Support at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. And it is my great gift to be able to welcome you to this book launch celebration um, for Sustaining Grace, Innovative Ecosystems for New Faith Communities. We are here tonight to play and have a time of prayer together to be thankful for the gift of this book, which demonstrates the gift of collaboration amongst many colleagues, both at PTS and uh, in the surrounding communities. So we're glad you're here to join us. I welcome you on behalf of the Center for Writing and Learning Support and the Barber Library at PTS. The book writing was supported by the 1001 New Worshiping Communities and the PTS Church Planting Initiative, and we are grateful for their contributions. Tonight, we are joined by our co-editors of the book, Dr. Scott Hagley, the Associate Professor of Missiology at PTS, the Reverend Karen Rohr, Director of the Church Planting Initiative at PTS, and the previous founding co-pastor of Beacon Church in Philadelphia, and the Reverend Michael Gearling, associate for 1001 New Worshiping Communities of the Presbyterian Mission Agency, and previously the founding co-pastor of the Upper Room in Pittsburgh. We are grateful for their participation and so glad that they're going to be here to talk with me and with you about this new book. We also um, want to offer thanks as we begin to Allison Pope, who is the head of user services at the Barber Library at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. Allison is with us and working behind the scenes to make sure that I don't miss any of your questions in the chat, um, and also to flag me in case I'm running over time in some area or not paying attention to something I need to be paying attention to. So I'm really glad to have uh, Allison as the co-pilot here. We also have Tyler Mumau, who is our IT um, coordinator from PTS for this. Tyler, we're glad you're here. Thank you for all you're doing. Also, a thank you to Dan Holmes, who directs the PTS mailroom and got many of your books to you, um, help coordinate that. We also want to offer thanks of support to local booksellers, including Hearts and Minds Books, who uh, collaborated with uh, Karen on getting the books for everyone. To begin our celebration, um, as we think about being collaborators um, and offering our gifts to God together, we are offering a video of dance performed by Michael Gerling, one of the book's uh, co-writers um, and co-editors, um, and Ms. Yubin Kim. Their dance together is an example of a collaborative spiritual practice that the book both models and advocates. So those of us you can see right now are going to disappear so that Tyler can allow all of us to enjoy this video of Michael and his partner dancing. In the cylinder. When the night has come. And the land is and the moon is the only light we'll see. Oh, shit, no, I won't be afraid. No, I won't be afraid. Just as long as you stand. Stand by me. Oh, darling, darling, stand by me. Oh, won't you stand by me? Oh, won't you stand, stand by me? Stand by me. If the sky then we look upon should tumble and fall or the mountain should crumble to the sea 
I won't cry. I won't cry. No, I won't shed a tear. Just as long as you stand, stand by me. So, darling, darling, stand by me. 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 Prompt. <laughs>
Um, and it kind of cleared the air so that when we were fighting with each other, it wasn't personal, right? It was like, wait a minute, I, you know, this is my truth. Let me hear your truth and let's talk about it. Um, and so it was, a, it was a rather spirited conversation in addition to being kind of artistic and, and multilingual that way. I think I can think of other places I'd like to use that hat. <laughs> Open source material. I mean, seriously, that's awesome. Was it like a cowboy hat or like what kind of hat was it? <laughs> Honestly, if I had still been in the church world, I would have had a literal hat for this. Um, okay. I didn't, I didn't want to get too left out of the seminary conference room. <laughs> I think it might have been a Yankees hat, but I'm not sure. <laughs> right. Oh, well, yeah, fair. <laughs> Well, that's, that is so great. Thanks, Karen. That is what an incredible process. And how, Scott, did that, did y'all go from like that kind of process to putting this stuff back into words? So like here you have um, kind of blown the whole idea of like, we all have to be so wordy. And now we're like trying to put the genie back in the bottle or, you know, talk to me about that. How'd that go? Yeah, I don't think, I don't know if at the front end we were confident that we would have a book um, as a result of, of, of the work. Um, and, uh, but, but after, you know, coming away from the conversation, Karen, uh, Michael, and I um, sat down with the notes and with the essays. And, and what our last session with the group, we actually talked about possible outcomes for this. And, and we, there was a, a, a sense that if we could figure out a way to, to, thematize uh, the work that we had done, you know, that we were energetic about creating a book and maybe even some other resources as well. Um, but, you know, it, it, we had to do some synthesizing work. And so, you know, over several meetings, um, Karen, Michael, and I, you know, sat down with the notes and the essays and, and kind of worked through it. And I think for us, one of the um, aha moments was that um, what we had embodied um, was also the, the message, was also the theme, you know, so I think initially we had gathered these, you know, folks together to help sort of solve a problem that we could identify with um, sustainable, questions of sustainability in legacy congregations, but questions of sustainability in new churches, especially in new church development. And, um, and in order to solve that, we wanted, you know, people that were working, you know, fundraisers and people that were um, that were church planters and people that were theologians and people that worked in denominations and things like that. Um, but we realized that the conversation that we embodied was a conversation about how kind of all different parts of our denominational and, um, you know, our denominational ecosystem is sort of, in, you know, affected by and invested in sort of the well-being of one another. And that this is actually um, this is actually one of the possible solutions to this question of sustainability. Um, that rather than frame um, the question of sustainability purely in terms of like economic competition, which is how can we give you enough money to get started so that you can be self-sustaining, a self-sustaining competitor among other congregations in the in the you know neighborhood or whatever. Um, how do we think about the kind of common life of our church, um, you know, capital C church in a place and, um, and, and how do we sort of invest in and create systems that can nurture that? And so that, that became, you know, the ecosystem metaphor um, really drew out of that conversation. So then I think the next step was, was then um, writing up a kind of introductory essay and we sent that introductory essay back out to the contributors and, and together we kind of thought about how the contributions that each person brought to the conference could be um, um, re, not necessarily rewritten, but kind of adapted for the, um, the, the theme of the book. Um, so it was a you know, multi-level kind of process, but a, um, you know, I'm really grateful for all of those that said yes to the rewrite to, you know, bring this together. I'm interested if I can do a little follow-up question on that, which is just that, so you all didn't start out with like this overarching idea of we're going to thematically, um, you know, do this. Uh, I mean, it sounds like it really came out of the bubbling up of 
through the conversation that you had, the ideas that people brought, and that it was an iterative process. So there was this sort of feedback loop that was happening both at the time you all were meeting and then even afterwards. Um, that's a different way of doing a book than a lot of people you know, who have it set up ahead of time. Oh, good, there's Michael. Welcome, Michael, great to see you. Glad you're able to be here. Um, so I'm interested in that. I mean, like, um, you know, why did you decide to go at it that way? In terms of this sort of um, open-ended, you know, just see, throw stuff at the wall and see what happens approach. I mean, I think in part, I mean, I saw Karen unmuted, so I'll go okay. quick and then like Karen. I, I think in part we were, um, um, in these kinds of these kinds of questions, these that are what I would name like an adaptive challenge for the church. Um, you know, what makes it an adaptive challenge is we don't actually have the know how know how to solve it, and so the the way to the way to solving an adaptive challenge is experimentation and reflection and getting new people into the room. You know, getting new voices around the table. And, and so I think that was our starting place is to say, here's a question that we don't want to throw a sort of technical fix at. We want to mm -hmm. address it at an adaptive level. So that necessitated a process like this, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I will just confess that I, I did not think that we would come up with an answer to the question. I had despaired that there was an answer to the question of this, mm -hmm. um, or, or like a methodology to kind of attack it with. And, mm -hmm the like gifts of working with Scott who's worked with adaptive leadership for a long time is that he will often say like let's do this process and see what bubbles up and I'm always like nothing will bubble up this will never work and we go through the process and lo and behold something bubbles up and I think that was kind of what was most powerful because when he said we didn't know we'd get a book out of it that was in in large part because I was going I don't I can't imagine how this would possibly become um but then people brought in such brilliance and we had such fun kind of talking through those things together. It's really powerful. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And I'd like to, um, Scott, I know I want to have you do a reading but in, from the book in just a moment, but I want to weave Michael in if Michael, you feel ready now that you're here. Um, you know, Michael, for you, I mean, what did you notice bubbling up that either surprised you or um, you know, was unexpected or uh, a theme that one of y'all's colleagues brought out that you, uh, that kind of like um, changed the way you were thinking about things or the way that you were understanding the process um, of making, of, of having the conversation and then, and then what eventually became the book. Yeah, well, I think I, I agree with what Karen and Scott just said that the, the challenge of sustainability for new worshiping communities from where I sit in the national offices is, is one of the biggest questions and one of the biggest unsolved questions, in part because of the way we changed uh, how we start new worshiping communities and what they look like only started seven or eight years ago. And so many of them haven't had the opportunity to be sustainable yet. And so they're just starting to wrestle with these questions. And I think what, what struck me throughout the process was how much the process itself became the gift that people um, were taking away, that they were valuing the, the opportunity for as new worshiping community leaders to hear from academics and to hear from those who are leading established churches and national agencies of the church and vice versa. Uh, and that uh, feeling of, of needing one another and for that relationship to be an end in itself and not a means to an end was really significant. Yeah, that echoes so well with a lot of the points that you all and your other co-authors um, made in terms of relationships not being uh, transactional, um, but having other, other qualities and depth to them, uh, which I really appreciated about the book. Um, I want to um, ask some more questions, but before that, I'd like to ask Scott if he would take uh, just a few minutes and read a little bit from the book so that our um, other participants um, who are here can hear a little bit of the book just in case you have not had a chance to read it yet. And I hope you'll put it on the top of your book list uh, after this evening. Um, so Scott, I'm gonna turn it over to you for a few minutes. Sure, um, you know, I thought initially I was brought to the group because of my ability to sing and to dance, but apparently I'm just the one left with words. So here we go. This is out of the introduction. In one of the opening scenes of Brother Sun, Sister Moon, 
the son of a wealthy medieval textile merchant, when offered the family business, instead strips off his brightly colored clothes and walks through the streets of his hometown, Assisi. Courageous, devoted, and incredibly vulnerable, the film crap captures what will become the parabolic power of medieval mendicant movements. The figure whom we know as St. Francis of Assisi took public and prophetic action, visibly protesting the trappings of wealth and the economic assumptions that promote it. The film wants us to see that the rest of his ministry was the natural extension of this initial act. St. Francis and those devoted to his way lived lives of radical dependence upon the generosity of others, demonstrating in their vulnerability the surprising abundance of medieval economic life and the scarcity experienced by those groaning under economic oppression. It is not as though St. Francis demonstrates a way of life offered to everyone. He did, in the end, put clothes back on that were made, presumably, by a textile merchant. Gifts of shelter, money, and food were generously offered by those who made a living making, building, buying, and selling in the emerging, emerging economies of medieval Europe. And yet the Franciscan presence signals the contradictions of economic life. Money cannot buy love or meaning, and its circulation tends to threaten and corrupt whatever it touches, but we cannot do without it. Francis can march naked in protest, but eventually he has to wear something and draw an income from somewhere. Creative and transformative movements often make their home in the invisible contradictions of an era. They do not always display a universal path through social tensions, but rather raise questions, create discomfort, and agitate for new dreams to emerge. Parabolic and prophetic actions function as a means of grace within cultures and social ecologies deadened by ideological boredom. While perhaps not a new mendicant movement, the innovative entrepreneurial church leaders across the United States often find themselves in their own St. Francis kind of moments. The statistics on mainline Protestant church attendance are well known to denominational leaders and an, and an experiential reality to churchgoers. Yet in many of our denominations, our most promising leaders have shirked the mantle of nostalgia and imagined a different kind of future for mainline Christianity. In systems that assume particular economic and cultural capital for ordained ministry, pioneering leaders are cultivating Christian communities bivocationally on shoestring budgets and sometimes without theological education and a clerical collar. In denominations rich in real estate and endowments, these leaders are, are imagining church communities meeting in homes and third spaces, even envisioning repurposed church buildings as community centers. By shedding comfortable religious structures and forms, these church leaders make themselves a compelling and provocative presence. On the one hand, they visibly protest the trappings of white mainline civil religion. And on the other hand, the vulnerability of such emerging communities makes them dependent upon whatever coaching, funds, benefits, and insurance such denominational systems can offer. But as with St. Francis, these new leaders and the communities they cultivate are a means of grace for their reluctant denominational systems. Their presence punctuates the ideological boredom of mainline religion, provoking new possibilities and dreams for Christian community in the United States. And yet their prophetic status makes them vulnerable and uncomfortably related to the denominational systems that need them. So let us in this book state our thesis as clearly as possible. American mainline denominational systems need pioneering adaptive leaders to experiment with new forms of Christian community, to dream a new shape for Christian identity in our present context. So also pioneering and adaptive leaders need mainline denominational systems to provide the support that might make their work sustainable over the long haul. A creative space is opened up by this contradiction. Those setting aside the nostalgic covering of legacy congregations need the continuity and security that these congregations provide. At the same time, legacy congregations need to learn to dream new dreams. Thanks, Scott. I really appreciate that. I, I feel like it does help give an, uh, sort of an entrance into the book, um, does what it's supposed to do as an intro, I would say, as a writing teacher. Um, I wanted to turn to each of you now about 
your chapters that you wrote and ask you a little bit about that. So in light of, you know, this framing that Scott just did, so for Karen first, um, you know, thinking about these new dreams and possibilities and also the vulnerability um, of these new communities of faith, um, I'm interested in how you chose to approach that in your chapter, which was looking at institutional and financial challenges um, in particular ways. So could you tell us a little bit about that and, and what's the St. Francis moment that kind of engendered your response um, in the way that, that you chose to write about this? Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm writing, I had actually, like I said, you know, I wasn't sure this would become a book on the front end. My essay changed significantly over the course of time um, as I heard kind of what other people had to say and um, my own experiences shifted and changed. Um, but I, I used to work at a really lovely faith community in Center City, Philadelphia. Um, there was a particularly visually striking place. Um, and it, it offered wraparound services for folks dealing with homelessness, vulnerability, um, food scarcity, et cetera, and was in an old Presbyterian church um, that had since closed. And it had beautiful stained glass windows and peeling walls and um, was caring kind of for the most vulnerable people. And working there was a, an incredible gift because it, it meant to, in um, its work together, invite all the people present to host each other. So I was regularly being hosted by people who were vulnerable, vulnerable people were being hosted by me. Um, and it was a rather level kind of playing field. And that was incredibly powerful and a gift. And at the same time, it was clear that my life there was not sustainable um, and the lives of my peers. So, I mean, the place ran on the energy and fumes of tons of faithful volunteers and also a rotating crew of 20 somethings who you know, made no money and eventually got exhausted. And looking at that incredibly beautiful space and that incredibly beautiful thing and realizing that it doesn't, it's not sustainable and it isn't working in the ecosystem that we have really kind of led me to think, okay, there's something broken that's bigger than this place. Like this place is doing something incredibly powerful. How is it that something doing this incredibly powerful work can't, um, can't function as a healthy part of a healthy, broader ecosystem. Um, and so experiences like that pushed me to think about how do we thread this needle? How do we make this work? I don't believe in scarcity. And that was one of the lessons of that place. I believe in enoughness. Um, my mother would say, uh, you know, our God owns the cows on a thousand hills. She would say that a lot when we were growing up. And I think that's true, right? Um, but that is true in an ecosystem wide way because we can see scarcity in small places all the time. Um, we see it, we bear witness to it. And that to me, scarcity in small places affecting the same people over and over particularly is a liability of how we're living in the ecosystem. Resources being uh, hoarded in some places and non-existent in others is a problem. Um, and kind of inspiring my essay was uh, the story of Ananias and Sapphira, which is a pretty, you know, in churches we're sometimes shy to talk about being interdependent wealth-wise, like that feels complicated. Um, but in Acts, the Holy Spirit straight up killed Ananias and Sapphira for not sharing their money. Um, so the Bible takes like economic lives within and between churches pretty seriously. And my essay was kind of about figuring out how we can do that in a system-wide way so that there aren't such clear winners and losers, um, but so that we're acknowledging that the kingdom of God is at work in a bunch of different ways. And we need to be resourcing that as an ecosystem rather than trying to kind of do it all on our own. I think that that language of ecosystem, you know, kind of combined with these economic arrangements um, that you get to, and I mean, Scott, you get to that in your article or your smaller um, chapter as well um, on stewardship. So I wanted to invite you to talk a little bit about your vision from that vantage point, not just the overarching, but also through this lens of um, how you see stewardship or advocate seeing it a bit differently through this new kind of lens that your group has developed. 
Sure. I um, let me maybe start with a story that didn't make the final cut in the chapter. Um, when my oldest daughter was, I think she was five, we were camping um, with her grandparents at one of these campgrounds that has like a, a corner store. And she was given $5 from grandma to go spend it in the corner store, however she wanted to spend it. And I remember watching with to total awe as she went into the store and began negotiating with um, the, the woman that worked there and was like, using, you know, calculating with her $5 and then in negotiations with the woman, how she could get the maximal amount of stuff from the store for the, that $5, you know? And um, I think what I found so amazing about it, um, first of all, I thought maybe that might be my retirement plan. Um, but my second thought was um, that sh she naturally knew that the logic, that, that the economic system that we're in and the logic of it is to get the maximal amount of value for the minimal amount of cost. Um, she didn't come to me and say, what does the wisdom of my father have to say with how I should spend this $5? Um, you know, she didn't consult some other source. She knew that you get the most things for the minimal amount of money. And, you know, there's a kind of like logic that's built into our capitalist order that is just, I was just amazed that she had picked it up without me ever having to sit down and say, look, this is how the system works. And, you know, I think we're in, you know, that kind of a system, you know, writ large where our congregations, you know, regardless of our polity, regardless of our ecclesiology, our theology of the church, um, we operate like voluntary associations and we compete with other voluntary associations for uh, adherence and for money. And if we can't get enough adherence and we can't get enough money, we go belly up and somebody else gets our resources. You know, and so we have an economic, an economically competitive kind of religious ecology. And um, that logic, that ecosystem, you know, isn't just, it's not just an, it's not just an economic system, but it's a, it's, it's how we think about sort of organizing of churches and the development of new churches. And so when it comes to new church development, you know, the, the, the thing we're always aiming for is self-sustaining. You know, can we get enough adherence and can we get enough income from the adherence so that we can be self-sustaining? And by self-sustaining, we mean usually like a building and able to pay a pastor and all that kind of stuff. Um, and um, we, in some ways, allow congregations to compete against one another in order to like the assumption that is that the strongest one is gonna is gonna win out. Um, one of the outcomes of that is that um, neighborhoods that can afford new churches get new churches, and neighborhoods or groups that can't afford new churches don't necessarily get new churches. You know, and so large swaths of rural America, um, you know, like th there's a need for church renewal there that's not happening. Um, poor neighborhoods um, in large cities, same, same thing. Um, and, and so, you know, that's one of the sort of, you know, one of the sort of outcomes of this. Um, I, but I think another, another thing that I, that's sort of all sitting behind my essay. Another thing that I explore in my essay is the fact that um, I think that the, that the creativity and the vulnerability of new churches um, actually provides a kind of disruption to our assumptions if we allow it, that disruption to exist. Um, you know, so in the early stages of a, of a, new, of a new church development, there, it is not self-sustaining, it is vulnerable, it is dependent upon a wide range of, of, of other partners in order to just exist. And, um, and we see this as a necessary evil on the pathway to self-sustaining. And what I'm asking is whether this is actually a vision of the church that we should take seriously as a kind of prophetic, um, parabolic, you know, kind of reality among us. Yeah, and I wanna, um, Michael, invite you into this um, to talk a little bit about your um, chapter as well. Um, 
And I'm thinking about, you know, these terms um, like interdependence and vulnerability and creativity. Um, your chapter, you know, sort of looks at cultures, what I would consider cultures of silence in faith communities um, and what, what that does in terms of our relationships with um, leaders in the community, um, in particular ordained leaders. Um, but uh, and, and the way in which you approach that is to invite the um, spirit, need for spiritual discipline into the conversation. So can you talk a little bit about that, like the echo, this ecosystem from your vantage point, um, given what you wrote in your essay? Yeah, absolutely. So the, uh, the starting point for my essay, uh, I don't think these observations made the cut in the final form, but uh, I remember uh, before I entered into this role in 1001 New Worshiping Communities, I was starting and leading a church plant here in Pittsburgh. And I did that for nine years. And I remember uh, on the front end of that work, which was also the beginning of my ministry after seminary life, uh, I remember making an observation about some of the pastors and my colleagues who had been around for a while. And I noticed that there were some who I really admired and were just spiritually vital individuals and others who were quite burned out um, and a little bit bitter. Um, and I was doing this work at the same time as working in uh, a national parachurch organization. And I noticed in that organization, I couldn't find those bitter people. And I wondered why that was. And um, the biggest distinction that I could make was that in that other organization, there was an intentional structure in place where uh, your ministry was supervised and you had someone discipling you as a part of that. Uh, and I realized that uh, in our system as a denomination in the Presbyterian church, at least, it's very possible to go through ministry without having any meaningful uh, discipleship from another individual. Um, and, and, and so I was thinking about that a lot. And then uh, this, the observation that, that is in the chapter uh, comes from the work that I'm doing now running assessments for uh, 1001 New Worshiping Communities. And I've noticed uh, th that you know, in that assessment work, which culminates in us providing verbal feedback and uh, recommendations for the next person, uh, for that person to do uh, for their own spiritual growth. Uh, there are some folks who are very open to that and others who are quite resistant to that kind of feedback and to being, uh, for talking about themselves, right? And I noticed that it was the people who were the most involved uh, in our denominational systems who were often the ones who were the most resistant to feedback. Uh, and I wondered why that was. Uh, and uh, I thought about what sustained me in my own work uh, leading that new worshiping community here in Pittsburgh and realizing that it was really a spiritual friendship with my co-pastor uh, and the discipline of meeting once a week with no agenda for talking about the business of the church and simply for talking about our spiritual lives and having a set um, discipline of conversations that begin by asking one another the question, what's the state of your heart? Uh, and realizing that that was really what sustained me. And I, it's really underscored for me uh, the belief that vital uh, congregations, vital church plants, new worshiping communities are led by vital people uh, and, and that we need one another to, um, to offer that kind of feedback uh, in the same way that Jesus prepared the first church planters, the apostles, uh, by giving them feedback over the course of those uh, years they spent together. Sorry, I had to unmute. I wanted to say uh, you're you're a uh, sort of recounting of all of the feedback that Jesus gave to Peter. I was like, whoa, that's right. You know, like when you put it all together, you're like, wow, the, that guy got it coming and going. You know? Yeah, Peter heard a lot. I mean, and he was affirmed, and he was also um, uh, uh, critiqued by Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's some sobering stuff when you, I mean, it was so interesting that you put all that together because I was like, wow, yeah. <laughs> but that's right. I mean, and uh, I mean that the, the ability to listen um, to others um, and to practice listening as a spiritual discipline seems um, so important right now um, on so many levels uh, in churches and society and, and all of that. So I was intrigued by your chapter um, in part for that. So thank you for it. Um, what we want to do, um, I'm getting alarm bells from Allison saying you're at the 30 minute mark. Um, and I have some other questions, but here's what I want to do. Um, we want to share with you another video um, that's been produced by another 
uh, partner in this collaboration. And um, while we do that, I want to invite you to ask questions of our panelists by using either the chat function or the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, we already have a couple of questions, which I really appreciate. Thank you, Helen and Ashley. And we will um, get back to those um, after we listen to um, this song by Aisha Brooks Lytle and the Nettletons. Um, Aisha is uh, one of the authors of uh, one of the chapters in the book. Um, she's an executive presbyter with the Presbytery of Greater Atlanta and is the previous associate pastor for mission at Wayne Presbyterian Church and previous organizing pastor of The Commonplace in Philadelphia. Um, she and her group have um, produced a song about another language for prayer, which goes along with the chapter that she wrote, which uh, looks at four different kinds of prayer that she's witnessed in um, faith communities. Um, and it also, the song also provides an example of a way to collaborate in these challenging times, trying to get together with the group to make music during COVID. Um, so I want to invite Tyler to share that with us, and then we'll come back with your questions that you've put in the chat uh, while you're listening to this piece of music. Thank you. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been oh so kind to me And oh the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh we chases me down, fights till I'm found Leaves the nine nine I couldn't earn it don't deserve it still you give yourself away oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of
shadow you won't light up the mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me Well, that was pretty amazing. I wasn't sure how that would go. I mean, considering all the constraints, well, wow, how amazing that was just so beautiful. Um, we are so grateful to Aisha and her collaborators uh, for sharing that with us. Just like Michael, I wanna note since you weren't here earlier, thank you so much for the dance piece that uh, we were able to show earlier. It was really wonderful um, to, to see that and um, look at you and your partner working on all of your moves together. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, we have some great questions that are coming up. So I wanna jump into those. Um, anyone uh, who's interested, um, I got a note from Allison saying to please use the, um, the Q&A um, at the bottom of your screen rather than the chat. Apparently the chat's not working for those of you who are not on the panel. So. Um, please ask your questions, and I'm just going to start at the top and work your way down. My way down. Um, some questions are uh, seem to be targeted towards specific comments people made, um, and then others seem more general in note. So I'm going to try to um, direct them that way. Um, the first one I see is from um, Helen Blyer, who says, uh, "I'm fascinated by this conversation about sustainability." and how the assumption is predicated on independence and self-sustainability. I've heard Karen and Scott talk about how this is highly problematic from a justice and logistical perspective. I'd love to have one of you, or maybe even both of you, spin out the operative ecclesiology assumed by this model. And for those who don't know what an operative theology is, it means what church looks like in concrete terms. So uh, let me let uh, Scott or Karen take that. Sure, and Scott, please feel free to jump in. Um, yeah, this is, I tackle this a little bit in, in my essay because my argument, part of my argument is that our churches function like corporations. And so the board, which is the session or the governing body hires the CEO to do the work for the board. And then the CEO does the work to the um, specifications of the board and the broader what we might call shareholder or congregational body and it creates a really bounded circle so that the the ceo pastor figure is incentivized to serve uh, the board and then the congregation rather than the church and then the world um, which is sort of the 
the model that I see us needing to kind of move towards. And I, I'm not against economic models. We live in an economic world. There, we can't get out of economics and I think they need to be addressed kind of per the Ananias and Sapphira story among others. Um, but I really think we need to rethink the corporate model that results. I mean, our, our imagination is so dictated by uh, late stage capitalism and we have to talk about that and there are consequences to that and there are sort of leaps that our brains make when we're in that kind of system. Um, and so I think that is an ecclesiological problem. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, Scott, you want to add to that? Sure. I would just, yeah, I would just add to that, that, um, you know, I think the operative, I think that the key word in Helen's question is operative ecclesiology, like the, op, you know, not necessarily what we confess about the church, but what we are sort of communicating what we think the church is by what we're doing. And, um, and I think in, you know, in the United States, it's very difficult for congregations because of this kind of religious, this, this ecology of, kind of, of religious competition, um, along with our assumptions about individualism, that uh, we relate to one another as autonomous individuals, we relate to God as autonomous individuals. And so the church is essentially a gathering of individuals to receive religious goods and services to help us on our personal journey you know, with Jesus. And, and I think that, you know, that's, that's not just true for like, we like to sometimes pick on, um, you know, uh, evangelicalism for, you know, highlighting the individual relationship with Jesus apart from the church. But I think that that's a, that's a, um, a way that even people with different theologies of salvation still sort of behave in relationship to church, not, not necessarily because we believe that, but because the system is sort of set up and, and incentivizes us to behave in this way. And we don't always have the tools to sort of critically think about um, the assumptions we make about being autonomous individuals, being atomized, you know, beings in relationship to God and, and sort of on our own terms. Thanks, Scott and Karen. And now I want to turn to a question from Ashley Rossi that's for Michael. Um, Michael and uh, your last comment, you talked about um, vital people, and Ashley would like for you to unpack that term. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So this is uh, in the work that I do, I assess people around their vitality, which is a weird kind of awkward thing to do. But uh, th there are questions I love to ask and, and things that I look for. Uh, I look for evidence that they have intentional spiritual practices and that they have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And so I love asking, you know, tell me something you've done that you would not have done had God not told you to do it. Uh, and tell me that story. Uh, I look for evidence of uh, growing self-awareness and ability to handle conflict so that there's emotional resilience and maturity. Um, I, I love asking people to tell me at least two or three stories of conflict that they've experienced so that we can see if there's a trend, if they're constantly conflict avoidant or uh, something else, um, or if they have a good, what I would call conflict dexterity. Can they uh, navigate different, uh, different interpersonal conflicts in, in different ways appropriate to the circumstances? Um, we look for healthy social bases. Do they, do they have a healthy network of, of, of friends and family um, from which uh, they're going to operate? Uh, and so uh, a question I'll ask is, if you have an emergency at 3 a.m., do you have someone you can call? Do they, and do they know that, that they're that person for you? Uh, and then lastly, uh, we look for uh, uh, some kind of uh, sense of missional practices. Uh, do they have a, does their relationship with Jesus motivate them to take some risks uh, for the sake of uh, sharing that faith and love with others, whether that's uh, through witness or through the pursuit of justice? Um, but I want to see some evidence of risk-taking um, motivated by their relationship with Christ. Thanks a lot, Michael. That's a really amazing work. I want to, I want to know more about that, um, but we, not right now because we got some more questions. Um, so uh, Caleb Lehman asked a question that I think Karen says uh, in a private message she's prepared to address. So let me direct this to you, Karen. Um, how might the institutional lay clergy dichotomy be disrupted in order to move past a transactional consumption relationship? Um, well, that is a big question. And let me start by saying, I don't necessarily have an answer for it that's gonna solve that problem. Um, but one of the things that my essay is trying to push for is 
how do we think of mutual thriving as something beyond an economic relationship between a pastor and a community? It is awkward and complicated that pastors are paid, right? Like we, you know, it, it creates a, a lot of weirdness. On the other hand, you know, we see in scripture that the worker de deserves his wages. And um, I think that's true. So how do we think about that relationship as one of mutual caregiving and mutual vulnerability and not about transaction and everybody getting theirs, you know, the church exacting all they can productivity wise from the pastor and the pastor exacting all they can uh, financially from the church. Um, so the, I mean, what I propose is for a really tiny corner of the ecosystem and that's a signing bonus for new faith community leaders um, who may be paid totally differently than your regular ordained leader. Um, and the signing bonus is about we're invested in your safe moving into this neighborhood, in your thriving and health and getting established before we are paying you to produce for us. Um, and there's a whole lot more to that. And I hope you'll check out the essay because on its face, the idea sounds a little bit crazy. Um, and it did to me in the beginning too. But I think there needs to be um, a mutual vulnerability between what the congregation needs and what the pastor needs. And I think right now the system discourages it on both sides because of historic advantages that were taken. And those historic advantages specifically affecting um, pastors and leaders and communities of color, um, LGBTQ pastors, um, women pastors. Well, and, and that also leads into um, a question, well, a, more of a statement from Carrie Charlton who says, Karen, say more about footnote number four. And I'll confess, I looked up footnote number four, which is, um, the one in which you talk about that you call the sort of professional pastor he, and you give a rationale for that. So could you talk about footnote four uh, just a bit? Sure. Um, everyone let me do this. Such a long process of going through and editing this book and no one told me to stop. And so I persisted. Um, so I, I call the professional, professional pastor in the sort of corporate paradigm in my essay, he, consistently. And the footnote basically explains that the reason for that is um, the sort of church model that I'm describing is a, is a church that is well enough healed to have a, a head of staff and multiple staff people and um, is generally based on Board of Pensions data that I believe was released in 2018, which is when we started working on the book, um, generally is, is male. Um, and we have good data that says the, you know, the higher the job is paid in the PCUSA, the more likely it is to be male. Um, so the, the corporate structure that I'm talking about most closely aligns with churches that generally hire men to lead them. So I used he on purpose so that we could at least, at least note and not get into how patriarchy and economics are related, but they are. Um, let's talk about that some other time. But I just wanted to note that that's, that's going on. That's a pattern in our system. There's a whole book there, Karen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mike Hollihan um, asks, um, are there topics or ideas that didn't fit into this volume that you hope to explore in the future? So anyone who'd like to hop on that train. If I could jump in, sorry, Mike, I just, I, I was watching. Um, before I talk about this, just to say too, in relationship to the lay leadership, um, lay and clergy distinction, um, one of the other essays in the book is by Mike Moyna, uh, who works with Fresh Expressions in the UK. And, uh, you know, some of the research out of Fresh Expressions um, is uh, that discipleship processes are actually really important for creative new church development in the sense that, um, pastors should think about and churches should think about equipping people to be to think of themselves as creating Christian community in wherever they find themselves in society. And so each person thinks of themselves as a kind of church planter is this kind of radical proposal that that Mike Moyna creates. And so that's a pretty, that's a pretty radical way of, of rethinking that that distinction, which raises all kinds of other questions. In the Church of England system, it's maybe a little easier to, easier to imagine how these people could be sort of under the care of a, of a bishop and, and clergy and things like that. I think it doesn't, in some other systems, we would have to think more about how that would work. Um, but I think that's a pretty provocative essay. 
Um, in terms of other, other uh, topics for this volume, um, you know, there were essays that, there were contributions that didn't make it into the book um, just because of, of time pressures and interest of, of folks. So there was a, there was a really good um, uh, beginnings of an essay on uh, farming on, and um, thinking about agriculture practices um, in relationship to church development and, and, the, and just creation of, of community. Um, and I think it relating to that is the question of, of place and placemaking and, and um, for urban congregations, neighborhood. Um, you know, I think or organizing ourselves or thinking of our, how we shape our identity as a new church development or a congregation in relationship to place, um, in relationship to like mapping our social boundaries onto physical geographic boundaries. Um, I think is one way of, of um, creating an alternative kind of imagination for what it is we mean when we say us um, and who it is that we're responsible for or, resp or, or accountable to as the church and this community. Um, and I think that, that um, gets us into an alternative imaginary that's not so sort of consumeristic or um, competitive. Um, so that, that could be a whole nother set of chapters or a whole nother you know, project that we don't really touch on, but it was part of our conversation. And Michael, were you going to add something? Yeah, yeah I, I, I mean, this kind of gets to or hints at some of uh, the content of Michael Moyna's essay that Scott mentioned, but I think a topic that I would love to see a whole book on is a theology of leadership and ordination uh, related to uh, these new worshiping communities that are sprouting up. In the PCUSA, at least, at least half of them are not led by ordained ministers of word and sacrament. Uh, and that means something. Uh, I, one of my favorites that I visit virtually now on a regular basis is uh, this community based in Syracuse. And uh, they, are, they don't have a pastor, but they, they worship together. They rotate who preaches, preaches the sermon. Uh, and they use some lectionary resources that the denomination provides. And it, it just, it for me is this beautiful model of people doing church together without reliance on um, a seminary degree or a, um, uh, or ordained credentials uh, in order to have church. But they're, I mean, more than some established churches I've visited, they reflect deeply theologically together um, and uh, are deeply engaged with their neighborhood. Thank you. Um, Lori Arnold asks a question. Uh, how do we get a copy of the song? What's its title? You can find information um, about the performance credits in the chat. Um, I don't know about uh, the answer to getting a copy of the song um, or the actual title of the song. Does anyone else uh, have that? I can work on it. So get in touch with Karen Rohrer. <laughs> um, Nikki Collins, who um, is the coordinator for the 1001 New Worshiping Communities, uh, writes, not a question, just a ton of gratitude for the gift of this book and these collaborators. Thank you all. And Nikki, thank you for your wonderful foreword at the beginning of the book, which I, which I enjoyed. It helped me understand kind of the larger uh, picture and where this book fits in. Um, an anonymous attendee um, asks, do you have any advice for leaders of anxious systems that seem afraid of change and unwilling to face the unknown? And that's to anyone. This is maybe you can file it under the, oh, where to start category. Um, because I think, um, I, I mean, I think like that description um, is, is true you know, across the board for anybody leading a church that has um, that that has any kind of established history that you're trying to you know continue and make sense of, and I think particularly uh, in this current time of of the pandemic, um, I, I think there's a sense in which um, if, if you are not um, anxious and uncertain about the un, you know, and 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 facing the unknown at this, you know, you're kidding yourself. Like we're all gonna be facing the unknown. And I think there's in a very real way, there's gonna be 
kind of a replanting, relaunching that's going to be happening this summer in churches all across the country. You know, we're all going to be church planners in some way, I think. Um, but in terms of in, in terms of like uh, advice, you know, I, I think like there's a lot of time. A lot of times we turn to shaming um, congregations and and pastors or, or even people in our congregations that are resistant to change. And I think you know, uh, Heifetz and Linsky in their book Leadership on the Line say when he, one of the, one of the observations they make about change in organizations um, is is that um, people aren't really afraid of change as much as they're afraid of loss. And so I think so much of of um, the fear of change is is grief, is a recognition of a, of a time that is changing or kind of treasured practices or elements of the community that are no longer feasible or sustainable. And so I, I think like one of the things to begin with is to recognize that behind the fear of change is, 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 um, is this, is loss, is a, is a fear of loss and a sense of grief. Um, and so I think some of the best approaches um, to like church change have are, are rooted in um, spiritual practices, um, particularly practices of listening, um, the creation of space in our lives um, for hearing from God and for one another, sort of slowing our lives down, um, and um, and creating the you know space for conversation and reflection. Um, and I think all the really good sort of approaches to managing change in congregations is really about creating space and creating room for conversation and reflection. And I think out of that can emerge a new theological imagination that God isn't abandoning us, that God has a preferred, as my teacher Pat Kiefer would say, preferred and promised future for our congregation. And our task is to begin discerning that together. Um, that doesn't do away with the fear of loss. It doesn't do away with the grief, but I think it, it, it's, a, it's one way of responding, I think, pastorally. Thanks, Scott. A um, couple of notes here. Um, Lori Arnold and Paul Yancheck um, were able to find the song. It's called Reckless Love or Reckless Love of God, won an award in 2018. Um, and Paul writes that it is uh, was penned by Corey Asbury, um, if anybody wants to find that. And then Lori put a Google search link in the bottom of the Q&A for anyone. Um, we are getting really close to time, but I want to honor the uh, two more comment, one comment and one question before we go to the prize drawing. Um, so Rebecca Greenhow makes a comment saying, I began to see connectionalism, which we're so proud of, very differently after I began to walk alongside Black churches when serving on Committee on Ministry. It isn't working the same way for them. Um, and that's a dimension we haven't discussed is um, the issues of racism uh, in the church and white supremacy, which is a whole other piece of conversation that, you know, I would love for us to get to, but we are not going to be able to this evening. Um, we also have an anonymous attendee um, who says we've heard about problematic mindsets in the ecclesial ecology and a few proposed steps leaders might take in response to move toward greater community health. Practically, how might a lay person approach church leaders uh, and bring them into the conversation, especially if the leaders don't see the economic disposition as problematic? And I would say first thing is buy them a copy of this book and, and ask them if you could have a conversation about it. Uh, but let me let our experts talk about that. Go ahead, Scott. Oh, man. OK. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to file this in the old man category. Um, it, I, I, think, um, I think this kind of thing is really, is really hard. And um, uh, you know, I, 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 I have sort of two, two observations about this. One is, is that um, I think the best processes for uh, transformation in churches are lay leader led. Um, so work that I've done with researching how churches change, work that I've done as a consultant, the better processes um, help pastors learn how to manage anxiety in the system and create room for the, the, the whole church, not just them as the leader, but the whole church to engage a discernment process together about their future. So I don't think it's a... Um, I don't, I don't think it's a liability 
if there's energy among the lay leadership for change that isn't yet matched by the pastor. I think that's possibly even an advantage. Um, and, then, and then the second thing would be um, pressure about change as a just kind of general idea is, is often less helpful than pressure about um, uh, it, pressure around questions of vocation. You know, who are we and what are we called to do? Um, pressures around practice. What is it that we do together and how is that forming us as a community? And so I think there's, there's room for lay leaders to ask good questions of their, um, of their clergy. And I think when I was a pastor, you know, that was energizing to have invested, um, uh, curious, um, educated, you know, members that were kind of pushing, you know, me to think about, you know, the leadership of the church in new ways. But Karen, I'm going to let you go. I, and we need to keep it really quick because we got to do a prize drawing before we get, well, before we're done because we got we got that going. We got one minute. So who wants to bring it home? <laughs> this question. Answer it once and for all. Um, well, I don't have an answer, but I'll say also there's a vision piece here. Um, pastors often feel like they need to negotiate for more money because they're not actually feeling like they're doing something meaningful in their work. When I was planting, people would often say like, oh, well, you do the glamorous work. And I'm like, really? Because I feel like I'm making half of what you're making and cleaning up cockroach water in this leaky building and it doesn't feel glamorous. Um, but what we all got into this work for is to do something that's a matter of life and death and resurrection. Um, and so if we can move the conversation to how much we're invested in those things and right size the economic concerns so that they're not the transactions that carry the day, I think that's at least a start towards moving the system. Thank you, Michael. Did you have something you wanted to add? Because I saw you had your mic off a minute on a minute ago. Right? I thought uh, that's actually a great last word. Okay, thank you. Okay, Karen, it's time for the prize drawing. Does anybody right. have a drum roll? <laughs> this is high tech. <laughs> yeah, it's very high tech. We were going to do a random number generator, and it turns out I'm not up for it. I don't know how to do it. So, all right. This is the winner of our $30 gift card to Hearts and Minds Books, and it is Andrew Connolly. So congratulations, Andrew. We have your information from your registration, and we will be in touch with you to make sure that you as soon as possible. And we will also use this moment as a shout out to Hearts and Minds Books, who are the absolute best. Look them up there in Dallas Town. Ask for recommendations. They know all of the good books. Okay, and uh, we, um, I am so grateful to our panelists um, for your participation this evening and for your book. Thank you so much for all of the work uh, that went into doing this and providing this really amazing conversation tonight that is literally the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more we could um, talk about for weeks and weeks and months and years and hopefully careers long. <laughs> so congratulations to you all for this really amazing um, work uh, during a difficult time. And thank you to Allison and the, Bar the Barber Library and to the P PTSIT folks um, for making this possible. And as we uh, conclude this evening, I've asked Karen if she would send us out on a benediction um, so that we can end the evening in prayer. Karen, it's all thank up you. to you. Please hear this benediction. As we step out from these screens and back into our homes, May God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you, those you love, and for whom you pray, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. Everyone have a great evening. Thank you for joining us tonight.